And uh, normally we would begin reading in verse 9, but since we've had two weeks that we've been off, uh, off of this subject anyway, we're going to begin reading in verse 1 until we get to, to verse 9 to give us somewhat of a, a lead way. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now again, this is not talking about the uh, religious Babylon, the woman who rides the beast. We've talked about that in chapter 16. and chapter 17, we talked about the destruction of religious Babylon, which was probably papal Rome or a, a copulation of more than just them. This is the city of Babylon that represents political and economic um, powers. Verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she hath rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, meaning in lavish luxury. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she has said in her heart, I will sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And then the verse we would normally begin with would actually be verse 9. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, meaning in lavish luxury, shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Now tonight we're talking about the, the actual fall, the destruction of Babylon, which is going to be the political side of Babylon. The woman that rode the beast was riding a political beast. We've mentioned several times that the two Babylons that were mentioned uh, in these past two chapters we've been dealing with are different. One was religious, the other was political. The language that was used here was certainly far too literal to mistake it uh, for anything other than a natural or a literal city. Since the inhabitants of this city as well as others will lament or will weep and cry over her destruction. Also, the Bible tells us here that the kings of the earth, they were instrumental in the destruction, the fall of the mystical or religious Babylon. And yet here we're told they weep over the fall of this Babylon. So if there was no other proof throughout the scripture of any of the studies that we've done that the two Babylons were different, this example should be sufficient enough. The kings here are said to commit fornication or live in lavish luxury with a literal Babylon right up to the time of their destruction. We're told in the last chapter they became weary of mystical Babylon and then they even rejoiced when she fell. The kings of the earth had committed fornication with this wicked system or this wicked city. They had become rich on her abundance and now they're grieving or they're wailing, they're weeping. The term wail seems more, uh, more impactive here and more intense here. They're wailing over her fall. Some would say it's a sad day when men will grieve or weep over the destruction of something that's evil and wicked. But men have always supported things that were evil and wicked. And the Bible said, woe when men shall call evil good and good evil. A few years ago at a um, anti uh, or a, um, a pro-abortion rally in Washington, D.C., there were 300,000 people that showed up that wanted abortion to be made legal. Woe to the people when they call good evil and evil good. Babylon will set the pattern for the rest of the world after the church is gone. Everything in this city is patterned after evil or rebellion against God. Everything in this city is going to be focused or centered around the Antichrist and his system. 
No one in the scripture apparently up to this point of destruction ever dreamed that this city would be judged, that Babylon, this great empire would actually be judged. But by the time the sun goes down at the end of this day in the scripture, Babylon is nothing more than smoldering ruins. When the news is finally being reported all over the rest of the world through the news media, the world is stunned, they're shocked, and they begin to wail and weep over this destruction. Now, this may seem like a familiar text because September the 11th, this was read on CNN. Portions of this chapter was read on CNN News September the 11th because many people, prophecy preachers, were saying this was describing the fall of Babylon, which they were confident when the World Trade Centers fell, which it was the World Trade Centers. It was the economic center for uh, commerce around the world. When they fell, they thought that this was talking about Babylon, but we're going to talk about that shortly and tell you why it was not that. The Bible tells us here of three classes of people that I want you to look at that begin, first of all, to wail. Three classes of people. First, we have the kings of the earth that cry over the destruction of the city. The kings of the earth that shared in the splendor and the glory of this wicked city. The kings who no doubt benefited because of the power of Babylon. Now their own power is in jeopardy. It's threatened because of its destruction. The next group that's described here are the merchants of the earth. They cry also because Babylon is destroyed. These are the, the merchants that were made rich because of the uh, commercial system that Babylon controlled and now since it's fallen that business or their business is also ruined thirdly we have what's called the mariners they've been made rich by their importing by their exporting goods from the richest market basket of the world and now all of their ships are going to set idle and so their business is also ruined so much and so many depended upon this city that when they look at it in its destruction and the smoke rising from the ruin, they're going to wail because its ruin is their ruin. Now verse 10 said, they're standing afar off for the fear of her torment saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And we're not really sure what the statement means when it says here that they're standing afar off. Some scholars suggest that it's a reference to maybe like Lot's wife that stood afar off when she looked back at the ruined city of Sodom and Gomorrah and she looked as she had narrowly escaped the destruction that came. And so if we look at it with that in mind, then we would suggest here that looking from afar must have meant that these people also narrowly escaped the judgment of the wicked city. And when they look back in horror, they're looking back at the ruin or the smoke uh, that's ascending up in the air after they have fled from it. Now, some have quoted this scripture on September the 11th when they saw the films of all the smoke running down the streets after the buildings had collapsed. And the masses of people that were running and they were finding high places on bridges, they were even some across the river and they were looking over at that and they were weeping and we saw all the pictures and they used that. It certainly is applicable. You could say that it was almost a mirror image of that, but there's a direct difference we're going to talk about in just a moment. Some suggest, some scholars believe that this could actually be the kings of the earth that this is talking about that stood afar off and they viewed it. And they're actually... Uh, with their armies on their way to the valley of Jehoshaphat, going to fight the battle of Armageddon. And they're actually witnessing here, some scholars say, they're actually witnessing here, possibly through the means of satellite coverage, the destruction of this city, and they also wail. If the reference in Revelation chapter 16, verses 18 through 21, to the bowl of judgment being poured out, if it resulted in the destruction of Babylon, it was described in verse 19, seems to suggest here, then possibly they're standing afar off to escape the buildings that are falling over in the wicked city. Now, I'm not going to read all of these, but I do want to read Revelation 16 and 19. And the great city was divided into three parts. Why is it divided? Because there is an earthquake like the world has never felt before. The great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. 
And the great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So maybe it was the buildings that were falling that they were running from. They didn't want to be having a building collapse upon them. The expression here in the scripture, alas, alas, it's the same word translated as woe in other places in the scripture, Revelation chapter 8 verse 13, where it speaks of grief and also uses the word terror. And so people quoted this on September the uh, 11th because of the word that could be translated terror. It was a terrorist attack. The destruction of Babylon, however, in this context, it leaves no doubt that the destruction is certainly from God. The expression here, one hour, is obviously a, a relative term. It's not speaking literally of 60 minutes. But it was speaking symbolically of the suddenness of the destruction that's going to come, a city that was strong and powerful that took many years to build, to build to such a strength that it was, it's gone. It's annihilated in such a short time. Verse 11 said, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. The Greek word for merchants here, it's emporous. It's only used in Revelation chapter 18. It's used four times. Uh, according to the Bible dictionary, it refers primarily to wholesalers or those who deal in large quantities of trade items involved especially in international commerce. So it's actually very highly appropriate that the, the uh, book of Revelation here would list these two categories of world leaders as being kings and merchants of the earth together in such close company. And that's because the super wealthy and powerful international financers, more often than not, they are the power behind the throne. It's money that puts people in power. Kings and presidents, it's often been said that they often obtain and keep their authority by appeasing those who finance their political ambitions. In turn, those great men of the earth, they receive land grants, trade monopolies, tax loopholes, innumerable other favors from those to whom they have established in political power, all for the purpose of enriching themselves even more. You also got to remember that this Antichrist that's ruling here on this throne of the system. He's declared himself to be God. So he's declaring himself to be not just the God of the system, but the God of the world. And he does that, and he also declares that no man, by his command, is going to buy or sell except they have the mark or the number of his name. And those that have gladly lined up after the church is gone to receive their mark or their number... Uh, they intended to do business with this system. They're authorized now to do business with the system. But now they're going to stand when Babylon falls and they've got no system. They've got a mark and they've got a number, but they've got no system. A system that they had given their total trust and commitment to, it's now fallen. Their source or their supply is now gone. The people of the world are weeping for the loss of this city, not for spiritual liberty, not because a martyr has died, but because this wicked city of untold immorality has been destroyed. Now verses 12 and 13 together say, the, merchant, the merchandise of gold and silver, let me read verse Verse 11 here again. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and of fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thion wood. Thion is a very fragrant wood. And all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beast or cattle and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. This is a remarkable list here of those things which are found in this city of commerce. Many just read over and never pay attention to what he just said. It's very important what he listed there. Now, Dr. McGee in his commentary, he said, everything listed here was a luxury item. Babylon will make these luxury items necessities. 
And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because they cannot buy her merchandise or cargo anymore. Cargo of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls. And then we move from the jewelry department to the ladies ready to wear fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet. Then to the luxury gift department, all the thion or the fragrant wood, every vessel of ivory, every vessel made of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble. Then we move on to the spice and cosmetic departments where there's cinnamon and spice and odors and ointments and frankincense and then to the liquor department in the pastry center there's wine and oil and fine flour and wheat wheat was the food of the rich revelation chapter 6 and verse 6 tells us that barley was the food of the poor then we go on to the meat department for the t-bone steaks and the lamb chops because he mentioned the cattle and the sheep so this list here of merchandise covers every phase of business it was important after the church is gone business as usual will continue on all the way to the end all of these items that were listed, according to Dr. McGee, they were meant for a society that was accustomed to the better material things of life. In fact, they go so far here that they're even buying and selling the souls of men because it was listed here as the merchandise of horses and chariots and slaves, which the word can be translated bodies and souls of men. While the mention here of precious gold, uh, silver, or precious stones, or pearls, those things may have been things of value and beauty in John's day, but they even drive markets in our day. The reference to oil in John's day was probably a reference to olive oil, but if you apply, apply it to our day, all nations run on oil. It is the lifeblood of society. Now, now, I'm not going to get into some war debate here, but I've always I've always looked at it and almost uh, thought it was laughable when people hold up signs saying, no blood for oil. Well, if there was no oil, you wouldn't have electricity. You wouldn't have cars. There wouldn't be any businesses opened. The entire economy of the world depends upon oil. So you're saying, we want everything we've got. We want to enjoy it, make friends with all of our enemies, but we're going to do it with the power source unplugged. Nonsense. If we're going to survive, we need oil. We become so dependent upon oil in the world that if any one power in the world controlled the oil supplies of the world, they could bring the entire world to their knees in one day. Now verse 14 said, And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which are dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. All the things that had been enjoyed, all the things that had made rich, he listed here, all the things that were wicked or immoral in the eyes of God, they're suddenly gone. They are no more. The utopian society which the Antichrist and his cohorts thought that they would build without God, it is all ashes. Nothing will survive. The wicked city here, uh, was their plan was that it would be the queen of the world. The man of sin would sit there and rule from that place, but now it's all gone up in smoke. It's nothing but ashes. Verse 15 said, The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 26, For what is a man profited? if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. These men that were accustomed to dealing in loss and profit calculations on an everyday basis, they probably should have spent some more time calculating the words of Jesus here. What is a man profited if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Figure that up on a calculator. There's nothing more important than the soul of a man. The merchants were rich because of their business dealings with this wicked system. They now joined the kings of the earth in bewailing the destruction of this system. This is going to be far worse than the crash, stock market crash of 1929, the fall of Wall Street, because there was a future after 1929, after the crash, 
But there will be no future after this fall. Her destruction along with those who have uh, joined with this wicked system, it's going to be eternal. The scripture lists here both the kings and the merchants. They're both referred to as standing afar off. We're not sure what that statement implies. Possibly they're somewhere else witnessing this on live television, live satellite television, just like we do every day. Verse 16, and they're saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. They're witnessing this, the destruction of this city and it leaves the merchants of the earth feeling this loss and they say, alas, alas. Or we could translate the word, woe, woe. Those that have put their hope not in the things of this world, but in the blood of Calvary. Those that have put their hope in the blood of Jesus Christ, we're not going to worry about feeling loss or suffering loss when this old world is destroyed and all of its wealth and riches are gone because we put our trust in something that is eternal. Jesus said to the man that put his trust in the barns, in his fields, in fact, he intended to build bigger barns to gather in all of his harvest. And Jesus said, you're nothing but a fool. The prophet Zephaniah, chapter 1, verse 18, he was probably speaking of this day uh, in the book of Revelation when he said, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all of them that dwell in the land. God's judgment is sure, and when God pronounced judgment, nothing is going to stop it. Verse 17, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors, as many as trade by sea, stood far off. This is the third party now that's weeping over the fall of the wicked city of Babylon. They've sailed the seas of the world, they've transported the merchandise, and now they're watching their futures go up in smoke as well. And they're described here as witnessing this also from a distance or from afar off. The Bible said here also that it was in one hour. That doesn't mean that it was speaking of a literal 60 minute hour. It was symbolic of the fall of Babylon happening in a very short time. The erecting of Babylon's been going on for many years, but it's going to fall in a matter of hours. Verse 18 said, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto this great city? All three classes of people that were described here, men described here, they were all thinking the same thing. There is no city like Babylon. There's nothing greater than Babylon. And, and now they're watching the greatest thing that they knew or they put their hope in going up in ashes. Verse 19, this is their response. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. The psalmist appears to be making a statement here that's applicable. He said in 50, uh, Psalms 52 and 7, Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. There were wicked men, and they trusted in wicked things. And so their loss was felt to the core. It's obvious here that all they were concerned about, all three classes of people, the only thing they were concerned about was their financial security. They cared nothing about their eternal spiritual security. Verse 20, rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. The judgments of God are righteous. They're right judgments. Babylon represented what was contrary to God and what he represented. Babylon, we've talked about in the last few sessions, they enslaved uh, the souls of millions, bringing people into darkness through spiritual deception. The demise of this city, it represented something that brings a cause of rejoicing in heaven. Not on the earth, they're weeping on the earth, but in heaven, it's a cause for rejoicing. These emotions that are being displayed in heaven are opposite of what's happening on the earth. To them, on the earth, it was a great loss, but in heaven, it was a great victory. 
for it's finally the end. The reference here to the holy apostles and prophets, it seems to connect both the Old and New Testament together. We usually connect the apostles with the New Testament, and then we connect the prophets with the Old Testament, but in this case, it's different. And it may be because the Old Testament and the New Testament saints are both in heaven at the same time. They're all encouraged here to rejoice. Babylon is fallen. Rejoice, those that are the inhabitants of heaven, which also would include the angelic host. So you've got Old Testament, New Testament saints that are in heaven with the host of heaven, and they're all rejoicing because Babylon has fallen. It's a, it's a time for celebration because this is the end. Verse 21 said, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. We have another reference here to an angel that's involved in the affairs of the tribulation. It may be the same angel that we talked about in Revelation 14 and 8 that announced that Babylon was going to fall and to emphasize the certainty and finality of the fall, the angel takes a millstone and he throws it or hurls it into the sea and he uses this as an example saying in the same manner, Babylon like a stone hurled into the sea, it's going to sink to the bottom never to rise again. The prophet Jeremiah appears to be speaking at this same time in chapter 51 of Jeremiah, verses 63 and 64. He said, And it shall be when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it and cast it into the midst of Euphrates. And thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her. And they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. Dake's commentary, he said the phrase no more at all is used six times. And it's an expression meant to show the absolute truthfulness of the statement as well as the utter destruction of the city. Again, when God said he it's enough, it's enough. Verse 22 said, In the voice of harpers and of musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. Babylon was a city of many vices, but it was also a city of many pleasures. It was a city of commerce, as the reference to craftsmen in the verse points out. The reference here to musicians as well as to millstones could have spoken about industry and also speaking about the affluence that could be found in the city. Verse 23 said, And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy, merchant, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Now, Mr. Morris, in his commentary, had an interesting comment on this. I think it makes, really sets this up good. He said, for some time prior to this final judgment, Babylon has been in total darkness. Under the judgment of the fifth bowl of wrath, we covered this, Revelation 16.10, the throne of the beast and his kingdom have been plunged into an unrelenting darkness. You may remember us talking about that. He says, no doubt the city will have been designed with many ultra-modern illumination facilities, but the probability is that the power station serving the city will malfunction under the impact of the biblical plagues. Any hydroelectric plants would be helpless if the water supplies were exhausted, climaxed by the complete drying up of the river Euphrates. Solar energy plants would be useless with the city in perpetual darkness from the fifth bowl of wrath being poured out. Nuclear and oil-driven plants would be unable to function without an abundant supply of cooling water. Electrical transmission lines from other regions would probably be rendered inoperative by the intense heat of the fourth plague uh, and then would completely collapse under the shock of the global earthquake. Thus, the city of Babylon, for some period of time at least, will finally have to rely strictly on candlelight or kerosene lamps for its illumination. It will be a miserable and desperate place during its final days, but this shows that the judgment of Babylon is not only complete, it's also final. Well, I want to say that's probably a little bit of speculation there. We don't know, but we do know the destruction is sudden. The reference here to sorceries in this verse uh, as one of the reasons for the fall of the city. It involves more than just witchcraft, which is obviously prevalent in that place as well. 
I want to borrow another comment from Mr. Morris' commentary here. He said, furthermore, as noted before, the sorceries actually involved in inducement of religious visions and states of altered consciousness by use of drugs. And then he quotes here that the Greek word translated sorcery and witchcraft is pharmakia. And that word means drug, portion, or potion, or medication. So apparently he's talking about drug-induced things as well. We don't know what the extent of that's going to be because the Bible doesn't say. But we know that they're going to be convinced if it was not for drugs, it's going to be because of the evil spirits that possess them. Finally, verse 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. This city may have looked like a queen uh, to other nations around the world and other cities, but inwardly, she was corrupt. She was filthy. It was like the religious system that helped her to rise to her existence. She was beautiful on the outside, but inward, she was filthy. Now, we talked in the last several sessions about the bloody history that's been hidden from the casual observer both in religious and political Babylon. Jesus spoke of uh, those in his day who were like whited sepulchers. On the outside, they appeared attractive and peaceful, a place of rest, but inside, he said, they were filled with dead men's bones. Mr. Dake made this comment about this phrase, and out of all that were slain upon the earth, Revelation 18, 24, it seems to indicate that Babylon existed from the beginning of the human race, for in it is found all that were slain on the earth. I disagree with that and say that this scripture ought to be understood the same way that Jesus pronounced the judgment upon the Pharisees in Matthew 23. I'm not going to read these, but verses 29 through 36, when he told them they were worse than the preceding generation, and yet they felt like they were better. He said, you will be guilty of the blood of all of those from Abel until now. They would be guilty of that blood. And they thought they were the ones that were the most righteous. He said, you're not. This chapter finishes the destruction of political Babylon. This finishes the wrath of God under the seventh vial. Finally, the earth is going to be completely cleansed from Satan and his influence after 6,000 years of man's history. What a day of freedom that's going to be. And that's what this chapter climaxes with. Next week, we're going to talk. We're not going to deal with any more of this kind of thing. We're going to get into the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to talk about what we've been wanting to get to all along. That city that John saw coming down from God out of heaven, it's going to be a glorious celebration. And there's a lot of terrible things that are going to happen on this earth, but we don't intend to be here. We intend to be on the other side. We're going to be those that are shouting hallelujah to the Lamb of God because we made our calling and election sure on this side.